Welcome to the history Welcome to the culture Welcome to the community that dreams and achieves Living in change For better tomorrow Welcome to the Eunice Mala Show Welcome to the Eunice Mala Show I'm your host Eunice Molat. On tonight's program, we're going to go ahead and feature a veteran journalist from South Sudan named Mr. Victor Kerry Wani. Mr. Wani has been an active member of the media industry in South Sudan for more than 40 years. He's also written several books that he's going to discuss tonight, ranging from mass media in Sudan, the folk tales and traditional marriages of the Mahdi tribe, and also the historical facts that have impacted Sudan and South Sudan. Uh, my name is Victor. Kerry Wani. I was born in Mali, which is Eastern Equatorial State in Magui County. And Mali is about 80 miles south of Juba on the way to Nimule, the border town. And uh, actually, uh, after I was born, I grew up in the village and went to the village school in Mali, which was built by the Catholic Church at that time. Then I progressed and went to the Catholic Mission School in Loa, and later I went to Torit. Torit is the main town uh, of Eastern Equatorial State, even these days. So uh, this is basically uh, where I studied. But uh, during the Anyanya War of 1955-72, I took refuge in Uganda, where I did my secondary school, and I went to the college. Uh, the college I went to was actually giving courses on uh, the cooperative law and then the cooperative history and then uh, the cooperative organization. Uh, of course, this is an economic movement which was started in England uh, uh, in the 19th or 18th century, uh, around that time in Rochdale, but uh, I cannot. Uh, very much uh, know that in England, but in Uganda, of course, the cooperative movement was introduced by the British uh, when Uganda was still under the protectorate of the, the, the British Kingdom. And there, uh, of course, Uganda got independence and they established this cooperative college. And uh, this is where I went and studied. Uh, after uh, learning a bit of, uh, about cooperative, and I came back to South Sudan when peace was. Um, realized after the Addis Ababa agreement of 1972. So I worked one year for the cooperative, but uh, I had great interest in journalism. So uh, when the opportunity knocked, and that was the opening of Radio Juba uh, in 1974, then in January or in March 75, I joined the radio as a program producer. And uh, since that time, 1975, March, up to today, 2015, I've been actually working in the mass communication, and that is the mass media, in both radio. I work a little bit in television. I also later uh, switched to the paper, because it seems always people, after working in the radio and then television, they resort to coming to... Uh, the, me the print media, because that is where now they can write a great deal about their experiences. Uh, yes, this work of journalism is very interesting, and uh, I thought that although it has a lot of challenges, uh, the experience that I can take, talk to, uh, I mean, talk about, and tell people who want to be journalists is that they must always be very patient and uh, they must not easily get discouraged and they must work very hard. And uh, in my time, uh, many people are wondering how I could spend 40 years and not even changing profession 
but sticking to journalism uh, is that because it gives me a lot of privileges, a lot of opportunities to do things that I thought I would not have done if I was working elsewhere. Now, in this profession, I had training. Uh, I was lucky. I got training in the BBC in London in 1977. And also I had training for one complete year in Kassel University and Deutsche Welle uh, Training Institute in Cologne. And uh, I also had other trainings within the former Sudan, and I went to Nairobi, and then to Malawi in Blantyre. So <coughs> journalism exposes uh, somebody who is interested in the profession <coughs> to many situations, like uh, you go for training and then you visit a lot of countries and you try to interact with the people there, you know how they live, you know how the situation, life is, in that country, uh, for example, uh, if somebody asked me the countries I visited, I would say, well, during my time in Germany, I was able to go to France. I went to France twice. Then uh, we visited also Belgium and then all uh, the headquarters of uh, the European Economic Commission in Brussels. And uh, we also went to Amsterdam in Holland. So journalism is also uh, partly traveling and when you travel you just dra travel aimlessly but you go and then as a journalist you be very observant and uh, when people ask about how was Brussels or how was um, Amsterdam uh, you can be able to tell them you know in a very coherent and uh, very credible way so um, my work in journalism has made me to meet a lot of people here both here in uh, South Sudan and in, in Sudan and in other parts of the world where I have been. Now, uh, one time somebody advised me when I was interviewing him. He was Professor uh, Richard Greenfield. Uh, Richard Greenfield has been broadcasting on the BBC and many people uh, probably can remember this name, Professor Richard Greenfield. Yeah, Richard Greenfield is an economist and then uh, a political analyst and was expert in the Horn of Africa. And so uh, Southern Sudanese in 1983 invited him here to Juba to come and advise them during an economic conference. And it was during that time I interviewed him. When I interviewed him, he was very, you know, uh, moved by the kind of questions that I asked him. And he, and the first thing after finishing the interview uh, with him was to ask me, for how long have you been in this trade? I said, well, this is 83. I've been uh, in this trade for, since 1975. Say, so, you know, um, you publish your work, then I will see it. Now he went back to England and the work was published in Sudan Now, a magazine which is actually launched by uh, one of the ministers who was from South Sudan, Bono Malwal, when he was Minister of Information and Culture in Khartoum, he launched this magazine and the magazine was very, very popular. So my article was published in it and uh, Richard Greenfield uh, wrote me a note that he, he read the article, it was very marvelous, but then I should keep on writing because the end game, you know, you use this kind of word uh, that the end game of a journalist profession is to be a writer. And uh, I always pondered and I always think about this advice. And uh, that's why I was able to write a number of books. And one of them is this mass media in Sudan experience of the South. Uh, you see, I many you know, people these days, because South Sudan is now independent, when they see mass media in Sudan, they say, no. I say, yeah, but you read down here in block letters, experience of the South. So this is actually talking about the history of mass communication or mass media in Southern Sudan from 1940. And that's quite a long period. And uh, it was painstaking, but I was able to piece together the information that I gathered uh, for this book. I've also written other books, uh, the history of Islam, uh, in South Sudan. But of course, you see, uh, many people uh, in, in the time of the Southern War of Independence, uh, Islam was used as uh, that it was fighting Christianity to some extent, yes. But then my 
writing of the book exposed a lot of things. Even some of the Islamists challenged me, saying, no, no, you shouldn't have uh, said that. Uh, my main reason of writing this, uh, of course, there are many Southern Sudanese who are Muslims and they are academicians, but uh, one thing uh, they couldn't realize was actually to try to make studies in the history of Islam. Islam actually is a religion, and it is a good religion. Uh, but uh, some people in the north were using it as a political you know, chip for winning money from the petrodollar Middle East countries in order to come to South Sudan and to imagine going southward. Whereas Islam was already in Uganda, according to my book and my finding, and also there are other people who have written, like uh, Professor Zaigron, about the Sudanese Muslim factor in Uganda. He has exposed very clearly that there's nothing to say that Islam, South Sudan is a barrier for making Islam to go forward. It was not. South Sudan is never any, has never been a barrier because Islam has entered that part of South, of South Sudan through East African coast, the Zanzibari and the Dar es Salaam and the Tanzanian um, uh, factor. And so it was only a political uh, gamble and they wanted to gain a lot of power, a lot of money from there in order to, uh, to, to uh, for found themselves firmly, to fix themselves firmly in South Sudan under the false name that they are coming uh, fighting Southern Christians who are making Islam difficult to penetrate Central Africa or the heart of Africa. This is not the case. Even in my book, I said that the Islam was already in Bukavu, in Mombasi, in Kinshasa, in Kisangani. Now, where, which new place is South Sudan preventing Islam in going forward? So it was a fallacy from the side of the Islamists in the Sudan to make a bad name of South Sudan as a barrier to that. So my writing was so bold that some of the professors, in a uh, Muslim uh, professor in Northern Sudan, they called me, they say, you know, your book is very interesting, but you are talking contrary to our policy. I say, what policy is that? They say, well, uh, they, they believe is that uh, South Sudan is uh, making it difficult for Islam to go southward. Now you are saying that Islam was already in the south, beyond South Sudan. And this makes us defeated because we can no longer win support from the Middle East. So you can see, one of these professors is Hassan Meki, who, who became actually the vice chancellor of uh, Africa International University in Khartoum, and uh, several other professors who admire me because I'm not an academician like them, but they, when they look at the book, they thought that uh, I have actually overstepped and or rather gone beyond the Southern Sudanese Muslims who are academic, some of them even read in Al Azari University of Egypt. So they could not write this, and I did this, and now you can read this work in French because it has been put in website. You can read this work even in the Saudi University and in, uh, in Mecca. Um, um, there is a university there, they call it Umm. Uh, what, is, what is it, a village, Karia or Al uh, Karia, you know, something like that, university. They took a book of that and then they put it even in their uh, library, you know, electronic library. So this is the kind of work uh, that I do. Uh, of course, when you are a writer, you have to be very honest. You have never to, you know, to play with the nerves of other people, the readers. They, you have to put them defect as it is, and either they take it or they leave it. But when you put corrupted facts, then they are able to pick quarrel with you. So uh, nobody so far has uh, raised any quarrel with me. Is a, uh, I've published uh, books alone. Uh, the history of Islam in Southern Sudan, is, the Islam in Southern Sudan is past, present, and future. And then, and I've also written this book, and then I've also participated in writing another book uh, with uh, Professor uh, John Mary Blackings. He was at that time in Glasgow uh, in the Stratoclyde University, and uh, he collaborated with me. We were able to write a book about the Madi people from whom I came, and, and this book was published in South Africa. And uh, I have also collected locally uh, Madi folk tales, and uh, this was 
edited by Professor uh, Larry Soule, a British uh, academician, uh, who unfortunately several years later passed away. Uh, I was very saddened because I was not told about this after, except after four or five years when he passed away. But he was a great friend of mine because he admired the folk tales of the Madi people and uh, wrote introduction to it. So I published part of it and I intend to publish uh, the whole of the collection. So about 100 folk tales I've, I've collected, but now 54 are ready and uh, I put them under the title Trip to Heaven. Trip to Heaven and other Madi folk tales in South Sudan. Of course, uh, a <laughs> trip to heaven. This will make many people uh, to read. In that, uh, they will be wondering, uh, who is this who has made the trip to heaven? Is it a human being? Is it an animal? Is it a bird? But in actual fact, uh, this book or this collection of folk tales, which I will present in Madi language, translate it in English so that it enables people it enables people who only read English to, to read it in English and the Madi who may not know English to read it in their own language is that this trip to heaven was actually made by the birds because uh, it is believed that uh, there was a, a, a skin ladder which joined the earth and heaven but this skin ladder was cut by the hyena uh, and so human beings and animals cannot walk to heaven and it was left to the birds to go there. Now there was coronation of the queen of heaven uh, to which invitation was extended to the people on the earth and human beings and animals say okay since we cannot fly to heaven you birds go and represent us. Now this four-legged animal called Ito, uh, hare in Madi, has a friend, a very huge bird called Meru. And this uh, bird agreed with Ito uh, to be lifted. Uh, it's very funny because people will ask, how did he lift Ito? Did he catch him or did Ito put his head into his mouth so that he gets hold of him tightly so that they can fly to heaven? They will ask a lot of questions, and to be uh, not so funny, in fact, uh, this bird uses his anus in which he took clam his leg, two front legs into it, and uh, so the bird held him tightly, because they are great friends, you know, you can only do this kind of thing to a friend, you know. So they flew to heaven secretly, and uh, when they reached there, they joined the dance, and when the dance was about to end, he told the four-legged animal, decided to ask the organizers if he could be allowed to sing the song of Earth, the, the four-legged and two-legged uh, beings. And they were very happy, said, sing it. So he told, decided to compose a song, how his friend, called Meru, a giant bird, lifted him. And the mood which he used to carry him, and this infuriated Meru so much, uh, that he flew back to earth, leaving it all in heaven. And when it was time for leaving, all the birds flew back to earth, and it all because he cannot fly, was left in heaven. And in heaven, the organizers, the queen of heaven, say, no, nobody can remain in heaven after the dark. So it all has to go back to earth. And they brought him to the gate, say, now you can go back. But it all said, no, look, why don't you give me a a pot, two pots. One must be full with food and the other empty. Then they did that. Now, we just threw down the pot with full of food to the birds down to the people on the ground in the, on the earth, shouting that a good uh, food of heaven is coming down in a pot. Call it and eat it. And indeed the birds knew this was true and then they got hold of the pot took it gently and put it down and they distributed the food and ate it. Now he said a more sweeter food is coming in this second pot. But there was no food. It was Ito himself who jumped into the pot and he asked the people of heaven to pull him, to push him to come, you know, flying, rolling down to earth. And this bird, Meru, 
being very angry knew this was Ito. When Ito reached near uh, the top trees, Ito, I mean Meru went and then grabbed the pot and then flew with it over a mountain and threw the, this pot on the rock. And uh, of course Ito died in that incident. So this is about the trip to heaven, which is actually the opening story of the 54 other stories of different uh, categories. In fact, there are, there are animal stories, and then auspician stories, and then why stories, and then miss theology, miss stories. So this is all about the collection of Madi folk tales. And of course, I've written other works which are not published, and uh, some are political, like the work on Southern Sudan under Nimeri. And uh, I'm sure people, South Sudanese, whether they are in diaspora, in America, in Australia, and in Europe, uh, for me as yes, a local journalist who had lived during the period of Nimeri to write something about him in relation to South Sudan may be very interesting. But uh, of course, uh, this is a work of uh, 40 years. There are several of these works, about 10 here in this list I've written. And uh, I, 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 I actually am now very, very tired because it was a single man doing the whole thing alone, doing the researches, writing, typing them and all that. So uh, at this stage, uh, I, would, uh, I, I would appeal to my fellow South Sudanese and even other people of the world who are interested to promote history of this country so that people know their past um, and uh, they can come in to help me to have this work published. Uh, of course, I also am a Madi and I said that we have published with Join Mary Blacking and some other Madi, a book <coughs> which covers most of the Madi life in South Sudan and partly of those Madi in Uganda, but largely about South Sudan. and. Uh, Besides that, I have also uh, written a book about my the customary marriage. Uh, you see, the customary marriage is dying out because most people tend to now modernize the marriage, including things which are not actually in the traditions of the Mahdi. But uh, my writing of this is to capture um, this uh, Mahdi practice of customary marriage from disappearance or uh, uh, dilution because it could easily become diluted in fact uh, if people do not put it down uh, like I have done uh, of course there could other be people who might have written about it but I have not seen so far any book about uh, my customary marriage written by somebody else and also uh, Can you give us an example of a yes uh, it is very interesting you know I categorized the period of engagement, uh, because uh, a muddy girl to get married must be engaged by a man. And this man must have heard about her, maybe her beauty, maybe her elegancy, and then her hard work and all that. So he will appeal and go to meet this girl. Uh, this is uh, the period when people walk on foot to go to engage a girl in her village, and they go on foot. And then I've also observed during my youth how Madi introduced bicycle for engaging girls by going far away and bringing wives in other distant areas of Madi to their area. This was the, what I call bicycle era. And there was also uh, the period when uh, people introduced schools and therefore they used to write letters to girls and this is another era of engagement. But otherwise Madi marriage entails that once it is accepted by both parents, uh, that the boy and the girl must get married, then they get into you know payment of uh, the bride price. This is dowry uh, in form of money, in form of, of arrows. Uh, because the Madi also use uh, as their weapons, traditional weapons, arrows. So arrows are also involved in marriage, and then hoes uh, because they are actually cultivators. They also involve hoes in their marriage. Uh, the Madi in the past used to have a lot of cattle because in my folk tales I find that a uh, lot has talked about Madi kind of uh, keeping uh, cattle, but the cattle in Madi during a certain period have died in a massive uh, way, maybe due to some kind of diseases because at that time 
there are very few uh, vet doctors who could know exactly the causes of death of the Madi cattle. So Madi lost all their cattle uh, and uh, they had goats and sheep which they use in marriage. And um, so this is the kind of thing I talk about this uh, in my book. Uh, perhaps also, uh, of course, people give birth and to, to children, the children grow up, they get married, they live, they get old and they die. And uh, because of this, in every community, in every society, there is always death. But when death occurs, uh, pertaining to the married people, uh, they have rights. So I have written a book about the death burial and funeral rites because death is considered separately and treated in a very different form by the Madi. And the burial, when somebody dies, even the burial, for example, a person cannot be buried when the sun is very hot. Either he's buried in the morning when the sun is uh, very cool or in the afternoon when the sun is uh, going down to the horizon in the west. So this explains that a person must never be buried a dead person must not be buried when the sun is very hot because i think they are associated with some you know uh, misfortunes befalling because that person being buried at that time may be angry because they feel that even if somebody is dead he still he has got some power to know the mistreatment that his clans or tribesmen and the relatives may be doing to him so I have written about this and the funeral, the mourning period, uh, for example, in some clans of Madi is four days for uh, female and three days for men. For others, it is the other way around, for, uh, three days for women and four days for female. That is the time when people remain in the place of funeral uh, where the person has passed away and was buried. And uh, during this time, they observe a lot of things. There are a lot of discussions, like asking the cause of death. And uh, explanation will be required from the immediate relative, either a father or an elder brother of the person who has died, to explain to the mourners. Thank you for joining us on tonight's program. Join us next week, same time, same place. If you believe, you can achieve.